College and Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary. B, to proclaim the word of God calling sinners to believe in Jesus as their Savior, one and only Savior, and teach all the whole counsel of God's word. Or and C, to teach children to praise Jesus as their Savior and pray to Jesus. Hey, remember, got your answer? Okay, remember them. Keep them in mind because we're going to refer back to them as we consider our text with the statement, God saves because of his mercy. As Jesus was approaching Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday, men, women, children, they all praised his name, said, Hosanna to the Son of David, laid palm branches before him. And their quotes. The leaders of the people, the chief priests, came to Jesus and said, Jesus, tell these people to stop making this noise. And Jesus said, if they didn't make this noise, then the stones would cry out. And then he continued on, riding toward Jerusalem. And as he approached Jerusalem, and he saw the city, he wept over it, and he said, If you, even you, have only known this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from you. He wept because he knew the religious leaders of the day concealed the truth of God's grace from the people. Instead of teaching them the truth, people to confess their sins and trust in God to forgive them and the Savior who would come, they taught people to buy animals, to make sacrifices, to earn forgiveness. And Jesus also knew that in five days, these leaders would urge the people to cry out, crucify him. And in their blindness, the people would obey him. Jesus wept because he saw the days will come upon you, Jerusalem, when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. And they will dash you to the ground and you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another. He saw the day when God would withhold his protecting hand from the nation of Israel and his city of Jerusalem. About 25 years later, what Jesus foretold and saw took place. Israel rebelled against Rome. Rome crushed the rebellion, and soon Jerusalem was under siege with the last stronghold left. The Romans cut off the water and the food supplies, and at that time, according to Josephus, there was about 2.5 million people in the city. After the siege, he figured that 1 million perished, and 347,000 perished in other places. And when the people tried to escape Jerusalem, the Romans would capture them and crucify them outside the walls as an example to the others. He also spoke of such a food shortage that a mother actually ate the flesh of her dead small son. Well, after the Romans captured Jerusalem, some of the enemy went in, army camped in the temple. They brought their standards into the court of the temple and placed them opposite the east gate, and then they offered sacrifices to them. And when they left, they leveled the temple, burned Jerusalem to the ground, they took the seven branch candlestick from the temple, the golden table of Shobed and the golden trumpet, and they took it to Rome where they marched it through the streets proclaiming their triumph. Fifty years later, the Jews revolted again following a false messiah called Bar Pachiba, which means son of the star. Again, the Romans massacred the Jews. And from that time on, the Jews became a wandering people without temples or sacrifice or city. The nation of Israel ceased to exist. The biblical nation of Israel ceased to exist. And then Jesus goes on. And he gives a reason why all these events would come or took place. Because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. They did not acknowledge that Jesus was the Christ that God had sent to save them. They refused his message to repent. 
They refused to hear and learn from God's word that in the past, God had destroyed Jerusalem. He had destroyed the temple. He had taken their ancestors into the Babylonian captivity. Why? Because the people refused to repent. And that time, this time they refused to listen to Jesus and the prophets Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Daniel. They refused to Daniel, who was a very religious man, holy man, but when he prayed, he prayed this prayer in captivity. Daniel was in captivity. He said, O oh Lord, our Lord, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned. We have done wrong. O oh Lord, in keeping with your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and the iniquities of our fathers have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Now, O oh God, hear the prayers and petition of your servant. For your sake, O oh Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, O oh God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make these requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. And from this we see that first true and false question is false. The people of Israel have not been protected, have not, and will not always be protected by God as a special people. God in His mercy kept His promise to bring a Savior from them and sent His Son to redeem Israel. And what did they do? They rejected Him. Instead of repenting, they hardened their hearts. Instead of hanging on Jesus' words, the uh, leaders, they conspired against Him. And they called for his crucifixion. Oh, a lot of other people just went about their business saying, oh, that's not our problem. After Jesus rose from the dead, the leaders lied again and said Jesus had not risen. And many of the people believed that lie. After Jesus ascended into heaven, God sent the Holy Spirit and the apostles preached the message. And they called the people to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sin. And we get all excited about the 3,000 that repented. There was a whole lot more people in Jerusalem than 3,000, or 5,000, or 6,000. <coughs> Finally, God's patience had run out with this nation. He took away his protecting hand from Jerusalem. God's patience does run out. You know, if a nation continually and stubbornly rejects his word, if it refuses to repent, he'll take his protection and his blessing away. You can go down through history. You can start with Egypt. You can go to Babylon, which is modern-day Iraq. You can go to Persia, which is modern-day Iran. We can go to the uh, Ottoman Empire, uh, which is Turkey today. You can go to the Greeks and to the Roman Empire and to the to Russia, to Great Britain, to Germany, and so on. Time comes. And so also it's false to say that the people of the United States of America are and will always be protected by God as his special people. And some would disagree with that. These who disagree believe in something called American exceptionalism. So what's that? If, in brief, from a religious standpoint, it's the belief that because the United States is the biblical city set on a hill that Jesus spoke of in Matthew 5, 14, therefore it's exempt from falling like other nations. God will always protect the citizens of the United States because it and its citizens are exceptional. Those who believe that, however, don't have to take into account God's word written in Acts 17, 26, 27. For from one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them, the rise and fall of nations, and the exact places where they should live. God did this 
so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him, though he's not far from each of us. God controls the rise and fall of nations and empires so that the message of sinners repent and be saved can go out. And if we look at America and we see the great majority of Americans turn from God's word, they refuse to repent. They say what's evil is good. They refuse to proclaim God's word. God will take away his protection and his blessing, just as in the past he did to other nations. Now, removing his protecting hand will not give God joy, but sorrow. The sorrow that Jesus expressed as he looked earlier at the capital of his nation and he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings? But you were not willing. God's will is that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. But God doesn't force people to believe. People can leave him. After foretelling the destruction of Jerusalem, Jesus continued into the city. He entered the temple and began driving out those who were selling. This is the second time Jesus drove the moneymakers out of the temple. When he began his ministry three years earlier, he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. And so he made a whip out of cords, and he drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here! How dare you turn my father's house into a market? Still, the religious leaders refused to repent. As soon as Jesus left Jerusalem, they installed everything back in there again. The temple was their cash cow. Therefore, they continued to use whatever means they could to raise their money. They didn't care if the worshippers prayed to God or heard God's word. Their number one priority was raising money. Jesus cleansed the temple again and he said to them, it is written. God's word is written in the prophet Isaiah chapter 56 verse 7 which said, my house will be a house of prayer. But you have made it, it is written in the, by the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 7 14, you've made it a den of robbers. Repent me. Then Jesus showed them what God wanted done in his church. Every day he was teaching. He was proclaiming God's word at the temple. In the week before Jesus died until Wednesday when he took the day off, he went to that temple and he taught God's word. He taught them of sin and grace. The promise of the Savior, that he was the Savior. He called them to repent. The kingdom of heaven was near. The Savior promised that God had, had, had arrived. The chief priests, the teachers of the law, the leaders among the people were trying to kill them. They refused to listen to God's word. They hardened their hearts. They said, well, we don't need to repent. And they then sought a way to murder Jesus. As Jesus was teaching God's word in the temple, they met in private to conspire against him to get rid of Jesus. But they could not find any way at this time because the people hung on his word. They listened attentively to the word of God. And that's how they knew. They, they, and they knew that this is how God wanted his temple to be used. It was to be a place where people learned his word and heard his word and where people could pray. And that gives us the correct ending for the phrase, the number one reason Peace Lutheran Church, along, and you could add, well, along with every other Christian congregation of believers exists, is, the answer is, to proclaim the Word of God, calling sinners, all people, to believe in Jesus as the one and only Savior, and to teach all of those who have repented 
the whole counsel of God's word. As Jesus commanded in Matthew 28, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Now God expects, in order that be done, God expects every member of the congregation to use the gifts God has given to him or her to obey Jesus' command. As the word declares in 1 Corinthians 12, there are different kinds of gifts of the same spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of work, but the same God works them in all men. Now, to each one of us, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good, for the good of the group. So, why do we have a quiz today? You know, quizzes are not, you know, a lot of times you get into quizzes and tests and you what's the score? What did I get on the score? And we forget quizzes and tests and, and things, they are can be used as a tool to teach and review a subject. That's why we had the quiz today, to get you to, to, to review a topic. The multiple choice question teaches and reviews the truth that Christian congregations exist to proclaim and teach the whole counsel of God's word to all people. The church is not a business, nor is the word of God only for children, nor is it only for September through May. For all people all year, all time. Every sinner needs to hear the word of God. You and I need to hang on every word of God. You and I need to hear that we need to use our gifts for the common good. The true, true and false question, teach and review the truth that our whole lives are to be lives of repentance. Repentance isn't this one-time thing. We need to practice it every day. Those questions remind us not to think, you know, God has protected and bless my congregation my, for over 100 years and our school for over 75 years and that because we're exceptional. And as exceptional people, we can do what we want. We can ignore God's word. Those questions remind us that we should, should not think, well, since I was baptized and I was confirmed or I confessed my faith in Jesus once, I'm exceptional. I can't repent anymore. I can ignore God's word. I can do what I want. I don't need to repent. Because God gave his word at my baptism that he would never leave me or forsake me. Therefore, God will always do it. Never bring it to mind that we can leave him. They remind us that God will always keep his word to protect us. That the word he gave to us at our baptism. We can leave him. In addition, if we continue to refuse to hear his call to repent, if we continue to try his patience, he can and he will remove his protection. And he will send us to hell. No exceptions. Repentance isn't for the other guy. Repentance for every sinner. And you know what? Repentance is good. Repentance brought about by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. Repentance that moves you and I to imitate Daniel and admit we have sinned. We have done wrong. And believe that when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Not because of the righteous things we had done. Because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. So having been justified by His grace, 
we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Amen.